Welcome to our Heritage Worship Service. It's good to be with you, to be gathered together from wherever you are. Uh, just a reminder as we begin, this is a Communion Sunday, first Sunday of the month, and or if you're viewing this later, it can still be a Communion time. So just a reminder to get um, some bread and juice or crackers and water, whatever it is that, um, that you want to use and we'll be blessing that a little bit later in the service after Pastor Chip's message. So let's center ourselves and prepare to, to worship God as we praise God as we sing our first hymn, To God Be the Glory. So if you want to stand, if you want to sit, yeah, the words will be on the screen, but let's enter in and focus solely on giving God the praise. God be the glory. What a beautiful hymn. What a great thing to sing. What a great thing to say. What a great way to live, giving all the glory to God. One of the ways we do that, one of the ways we glorify God is when we, when we do the things God has given us to do, when we live the way God has given us to live, shown us how to live. And, and one of those things God has given us to do is to pray. So let's give glory to God as we pray together now. Lord God, we thank you. Uh, and we praise you. Uh, all the glory really is yours. Uh, there is nothing good that comes into our lives that ultimately doesn't have a source, its source in you. There's nothing good that we do that ultimately doesn't have its source in you. And, and you get all the glory. You get all the praise. Uh, give us eyes to see your goodness and your greatness. Give, let our ears, open our ears to hear your, your, your incredible, powerful, loving, merciful voice. Lord, give, our, give us hearts and minds that are open to your presence and to your leading in our lives and open to loving others in your name um, so that you can receive all the glory by all that we do and all that we say. Lord, we know that we fall short of that. We know that there are so many ways and so many times when we are living for our own glory or we're not concerned about glory at all, just trying to get by and we lose sight of you and we lose sight of the mission you've given us. It's so easy and we fall off the rails so easily and so often. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for drawing us back. We thank you for picking us up, for dusting us off, for receiving us time and time again. We want to give you the glory for that as well and the thanks and the praise. We pray all of this in Jesus' name and we pray 
together as he taught us when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So this is that part of the service where we invite you to uh, give financially to the mission and the ministry of the church. Uh, we call it the offering. If you've been part of church for a while, you know that and you're saying Blevins, we know it's called the offering. But, but you know, maybe some folks watching today don't know that it's called the offering. And, and why do we call it an offering? We really don't use that term much outside of church, uh, but that's what we call it. This, for many folks that are, are new to church or have been in the church for a long time, the offering can feel like one of those things that's just a duty or a responsibility, even a burden, maybe some sort of religious spiritual tax. But the fact is that the offering is another gift that God gives us. As much as we might think that, that our gifts, what we're doing is giving to God, God really owns it all anyway. We're just stewards. We're just caretakers. God blesses us with the opportunity to participate in his mission and his ministry and his kingdom in so many different ways. And one of those ways is financial giving. And so when we give, you know, we're actually doing something good for ourselves as well as good for the church and good for the community and good for the world around us. Because anytime we're doing the kinds of things that God has given us to do, there's a blessing that comes back to us as well. Don't hear me wrong. I'm not talking about, you know, sowing into the ministry and next year you'll get a check for $20,000. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is when we give as an act of faith, as an act of love, our faith grows, our hope grows, our love grows, and all of that is good for us. So however you're giving today, whether you're using the text to give, whether you're giving through GarfieldChurch.org, Shelby Next Giving App, however you're giving, we thank you. And, and, and I want to assure you that, that this gift is not only a blessing to the church and a blessing to the community, it's a blessing to you as well. Um, we use those gifts to widen the circle of Jesus' love not just in Cleveland, but all over the world. And we want to say thank you, God, for blessing us with resources. We offer a portion back to you. Receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're not able to give today, we understand that. A lot of folks have been hit hard financially by the pandemic. And if you're among those folks or other financial crisis in your life and you're not able to give, that's okay. There are other ways that, that you can bless and be blessed in your service to God. But we do want to let you know about two things that are happening. Everything that you give goes to widen the circle. Two of those things that are happening this week we want to highlight. One is we're doing another after party after church today at 1 p.m. Uh, and it's on. You know, we're having a Zoom chat that you can join in, talk more about the worship, more about the service, more about the sermon, how it impacted you. Just a chance for us to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, that's at 1 p.m. If you go to GarfieldChurch.org and you can you can find the link for that so that you can participate in that Zoom chat. It's going to be great. The other thing that's happening this week is we're launching a brand new uh, YouTube broadcast broadcast on our church YouTube channel. So if you go to Garfield Church. Uh, I'm sorry, go to YouTube and search for Garfield Memorial Church. Uh, you'll find our YouTube channel. Don't forget to click subscribe so you get updates whenever new videos are posted. But we're starting a new broadcast this week called 24 Billion Stories. I'm hosting that. And it's all about the, the billions and billions and billions of different stories that are out there. Your stories, my stories, the stories of other folks near and far away. And, and how those affect us and how those impact us and how those intersect with our life of faith and, and our following of Jesus Christ. So there'll be two videos dropping each week, one on Mondays and one on Wednesdays. All of that's going to be YouTube. You can check it out if you go to Garfield Memorial Church's YouTube channel and click that subscribe button. Then you will always get notified and you'll never miss an episode. With all that said, let's continue in worship. Actually, as we continue in worship, you're going to see a video about 24 billion stories, and then we're going to hear the choir sing a beautiful anthem, a Lux Eterna. Let's continue worshiping together. Have you ever heard this before? There are eight 
million stories in the naked city. That might be true, but there are nearly 8 billion people in this world, and if every person has just three stories, that means there are at least 24 billion stories in this amazing world. Welcome to... Next year, we're going to explore some of the best and worst of those stories. We've created a YouTube broadcast that will help us hear. Those aren't pillows. Don't! I've killed him. Everything I touch gets ruined. See? Tell and respond to as many of those stories as we can. Each Monday and Wednesday, a new video will drop. On Mondays, we'll introduce the story, and on Wednesdays, we'll go deeper to see what's behind the scenes, the myths, and the whitewash. The first video drops Monday, October 5th, and you don't want to miss it. So go to youtube.com slash Garfield Memorial Church and select the 24 Billion Stories playlist. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode.
let's hear God's word now. We're reading in the New Testament, the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. So then remember that at one time, you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision, by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, for through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Sometimes it's moments of brokenness which create the greatest transformations. Times where fear gives birth to faith, pain leads to healing, and chaos dissolves into peace. It's in these times we often see God more clearly. For in our deepest turmoil, He remains faithful. When our spirit is crushed, He remains strong. When our moment is too heavy, He carries the burden. As gold is refined by fire, we too are often refined by struggle. It's part of growing, changing, becoming. Lately, the journey has been difficult. Our breath has been labored. Our steps uneasy. But we stand in faith, knowing who is leading us through this desert. The God of peace, the God of hope, the God of restoration. We're continuing today in our series, Reconciled, this ministry of reconciliation that we really feel has been placed on Garfield Memorial Church, placed on all churches, placed on all followers of Christ. We're digging deep in it. And as a pastoral team, we prayed about this and we're, we're really gonna extend this teaching series right through the upcoming election because we think this theme of reconciliation is so important, in, in, in especially in this time where hostilities might be escalating, okay? That we need to be a different kind of presence in the world in bearing the ministry of reconciliation. So here, we're in part four. Uh, the first two weeks, Pastor Scott and I went into creation and looked at those questions at creation that we need to answer to get ourselves fit and right and reconciled with God that we might reconcile with others. Last week, we went all the way to the end of the Bible and Revelation, and Pastor Terry and I talked about the Revelation 7-9 church that, you know, we, where we've come from and where we're going, the trajectory of Christ's church. And now we're going to get into the meat that's in the middle where obviously Jesus himself in the Gospels and Paul and Peter and others in their writings, in their letters, what is referred to as the Apostles' teaching, begin to teach us how to live that out now. And here we have this passage from Ephesians, the second chapter. I, I have drunk deep from this well of these words for weeks now. They're, they're not going to leave me. Ephesians, we learned after Easter, we did a long study in that, was really God's blueprint. Uh, it was, sorry, Paul, God's, but spoken through Paul, his blueprint for what the church ought to be, how it should function. 
And in the first chapter of Ephesians, Paul begins to pray for the people. These are speaking to believers. So if you're watching us and maybe you're not a believer, that's okay. I would listen in because this is what Paul's expectations were for the church. And maybe when you hear that, you'll go, wow, I never saw a church like that. Well, look, Garfield Memorial is trying really hard to be a church like that. We fail all the time, but we're working at it. Paul in chapter one says that he was praying that believers might see evidence of God's power at work in the world. Boy, do we need that right now, don't we? I, have, I want Paul to keep praying that. We need to see in the midst of pandemics and natural disasters and racial anxiety and um, you know divisiveness, divisiveness, lack of civility, barking at each other. Boy, do we need to know and see evidence that God's power is at work in the world. That's what Paul is praying for, for his church. He planted these churches and he's saying, I'm praying that you'll see this. And then in chapters two and three, he does something amazing. He begins to say that one of the ways, the main ways that we see God's power at work in the world is the very existence of Christ's church. See, churches in Paul's day, all of the churches in the New Testament were multi-ethnic and multi-generational and empowering people that had no voice anywhere else. Women in that day and age had no power, but they had authority and leadership in the church. Something different was happening, Paul was saying. And he's saying, here's an evidence that God's power is at work in the world. People inside the church who outside of the church could never get along are now living together in peace. Paul says that is evidence. That's the greatest evidence that God's power is at work in the world. And he uses a case study. He talks about the circumcised and the uncircumcised. Did you hear that in the scripture? Well, who was that? Well, the circumcised were the Jewish people. The uncircumcised were the Gentile people. And they were living in, in hatred of one another. And Paul says now these folks that previously could not get along are now beginning to live together as one in peace in Christ's church. This is miraculous. And so he, he basically in this, in this short passage here addresses a human problem, something that has plagued the human race since the beginning, since Cain and Abel when I preached on that, the first time sin ever used in the Bible in that story, a historic human problem, God's solution to that problem, and then the strategy, the way God brings about that solution affects it in the world. So let's look at that together. First, the great human problem. It is what's called historic enmity. E-N-M-I-T-Y, enmity. In fact, in this translation, it's translated hostility. The old King James called it enmity. I think actually they got it more right, but it's even more than that. It's historic enmity. This word in the Hebrew and the Greek literally was, was interpreted Hatred, but it's deeper than that. It's, it's an active word. This is active hatred. This is enmity is defined actually by actively opposing or being hostile to others. This is hate in action, okay? This isn't just hate in my heart. This is hate lived out, right, in the world. And, that, and Paul is saying this has been a problem in the human race. And he uses this case study of Jew and Gentile. And he says, there is a wall between them now. They are living in hostility toward one another. And, and the wall was literal. I'll talk about that in a minute. But he talks about what has created this barrier, what's creating this hatred. And it may surprise you, but it's right here in the letter. He said, what's creating this is the Bible. Can you believe that? He said, what, what has created this is the law and the commandments. So that Jesus has come in, you know, he said to fulfill the law and the commandment. But here it says that the Spirit's coming in and abolishing the law and the commandments. Why? Because the law, the Mosaic law, was given to Israel, right? They were brought out of Egypt. They weren't a people. They were a very loose confederation. And here they are in the wilderness uh, being bound together by one person, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, by one person who was hearing from God. 
And God gives Moses the Mosaic law. He says, here's a way for the people to structure, to organize. Much of it was contextual at that time. But nonetheless, this is a way that if you live these out, the Ten Commandments and others, then you will, you'll be a blessing to one another in that community. And more importantly, you'll be a blessing to the world because that's why I called you, God said, to be a light to the nations. Now, let me say this to you, and this may agitate you, and that's okay. That's what you pay me for. God never blesses anyone because they deserve it. I want you to hear me say that. God never blesses someone because they deserve it. God blesses us undeservedly so that we then will be a blessing to others. That's how this works. Read Genesis 12, 1. This was God's idea at the time. Abraham, Sarah, I'm going to make you fruitful. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. Watch this. So that through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And see, Israel was given this law as a gift. The commandments as a blessing. So that through them, they might bless others. They might be a light to the world. They might call others through an act of reconciliation into right relationship with God. But what happened? Israel used the law to divide themselves. They, they added all kinds of rules and regulations and cleanliness laws and ceremonial laws. And before you knew it, the Jewish people despised the non-law abiding Gentiles. And guess what? The Gentiles despised the Jewish people for despising them. Nothing will make you more despicable than someone despise you, right? If someone despises you, you don't put them on your Christmas card list. And so this, this law that was given to be a blessing has become a wall. And God is, is working on this to, to establish peace, to establish shalom, okay? And it's, it's showing something that's within each of us as a problem in us. And we saw it in Cain and Abel. We saw it in the garden. That we were created to be in relationship with God, in perfect relationship with God, to serve God's purposes in the world, which then brings us into perfect relationship with one another. But we abandoned that because we wanted to be proudly independent people. And there were consequences with that. Because instead of getting our identity from God, as God is my creator, as I'm creating the image of God, that I'm living in right relationship with God, that I'm serving God's purposes in the world, which puts me in right alignment with God and others, now there's a brokenness. I want to be independent. I want to be in charge. And what happens is I have to get my identity somewhere else. Because if God's no longer in charge, I can't get my identity in God. I have to get in me and my preferences, and my agendas, and what, ha what happens? There's something broken, fundamentally wrong in the human heart that when we do that, we need to self-exalt. And when we self-exalt, you know how we find our identity? By knowing there's people that we are better than. We find our identity in being better than others. Jesus talked about this in a parable. Pastor Scott's going to preach on it next week as we've been, as a pastoral team, just really chomping through the scriptures around reconciliation. And I'm not going to preach on it, but I'll, but I'll just describe the problem. Jesus said that two people, it was a, it was a parable, uh, two people, a Pharisee, a righteous person, a lead pastor, uh, you know, a cardinal, uh, whoever it is, a holy person, a Pharisee, and a tax collector, a no good Nazi collaborator. That's what they were with the Roman Empire. This scoundrel. These two go into the temple and pray. And watch what Jesus said. He said, the Pharisee prayed this way. Oh God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. And there it is. The brokenness in the human heart, right? And so... We then, to build our own selves up and to, and to have an identity that, that we're, we're worth it and we are independent, we have to despise others, especially others that we deem are ruining the world. That's the human problem. And we've been dividing the world for centuries, since creation over that. So what's God's solution? God comes in, uh, Paul says, he, here's the verse. Chapter 2, verse 15, you heard read. He said that God has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself. Watch this. One new humanity in place of the two 
and thus making peace. Greek scholars have struggled with that term for years. It's, it's almost non, and, and it has an inability to be translated because it's saying it's so radical and so strong what God's saying here. He says, I'm making a new humanity. He's going back and restoring us. He's recreating us into our intentional design. So this is different ways we connect in the world. Maybe some of you belong to a club, right? If I was in a club, I'd join a fishing club, right? Because I love to fish. And you join a club, and why? Because you have a couple interests that you share with other people. And so you're connected with those other people through those, you know, one or two or three common interests. Or if you have a cultural background, we all do. Now you relate to people in your own culture, and you might have hundreds, thousands of connecting points, right? That folks in your tribe, that we do it this way, or we kind of, this is how we think or function. Do you know Paul has the audacity to say that when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, when we accept the gospel, that there's something fundamentally wrong with us, that we're broken, in need of a savior, but that God delivers us from that with an act of unmerited grace, that other people who believe that too, you create a deeper bond with them than even people in your own culture, than even people that have, share all of your same, you know, uh, desires and, and interests. That and I had two case studies on this I just bring up for my own life as I've traveled abroad. I've talked about this before, preaching at Garfield Memorial Church in Liberia. And I was there and I met Success, that's her name. We've tried to get her here and even post COVID in this broken world, we couldn't get her a visa and we haven't given up on it. But Success is our worship leader there. And I, I hadn't spent but three hours with her, a single African, you know, single mom, African, Liberian, uh, totally different languages, totally different culture than me, but there was a bond. And when I went to Israel, my friend Fote Mikkel, who I stay good friends with, Palestinian Christian living in Jerusalem, whole different life experience, whole different cultural background, right? Whole different ethnicity or whatever it might be. And, and you know, we, I traveled with him in, in 2017 and we, we correspond on Facebook almost weekly. Why? Because I wasn't with those success or Fote for more than three or four or five hours when I knew that I shared a deeper bond with them than people I grew up with on the same street who shared, went to the same school, who were all in my background because so deep, Paul says, is this connection for people who are aware that they're sinners saved by grace. And God uses that to create a whole new humanity. That's why Peter says, you're, you're a holy nation. That word where you're a other ethne. You're God's own people, right? Brought out of darkness into marvelous light. One uh, pagan philosopher who hated Christianity said that these Christians are like a whole new genus. You hear that? That's a word, like a whole new species. And we were, and we're called to be that. And so I, you know, I've said this many times. When people went to Jesus and said, I want to follow you, uh, and he said, well, come follow me. And they said, well, first I need to go do this. First I need to do that. I've said this before. I was quoting Tim Keller, a great preacher, who said, whatever's on the other side of that first, that's your real God. See, I am a, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ first. I'm an American second. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ first. I'm a Caucasian, Pennsylvania Dutch second. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ first. I'm college educated second. And you know what? I, I don't even like to say second because those things are so far <laughs> removed from the priority of who I am in Jesus Christ and allegiance to Christ's kingdom. I don't even, shouldn't even call them second. I can barely see them. They're so far behind. That's what God is doing in, in, in each of us and is doing in this case study of Jew and Gentile. And suddenly he's dealing with the horrible divisions. This is what the gospel is. Dealing with the horrible divisions that have kept us from knowing peace. And see, to do this, the gospel goes after the heart. See, that, that's where this transformation takes place. Now, secularism goes after the head. It tries to get rid of all the divisions by educating us and scolding us. And, and in some cases that helps, but it has never finally worked. 
The only thing that works is when the gospel does what it says in Acts chapter 2, cuts us to the heart. See, the gospel's not coming to just make us a little different. The gospel's coming to entirely restructure us. I'm going to talk about how God does that. I love in Mere Christianity where C.S. Lewis talked about that. He said, you thought God was building a little cottage, you know, fixing your drain pipes, patching up the roof. But instead, God starts making major repairs. What's he up to? The walls are coming down, the new additions there. That he's not building a little cottage. He, religion is, you know, just says, well, add something to your life. The gospel tears it down and builds a whole new palace, C.S. Lewis said, because God comes and intends to dwell there in you and in me. And so he restructures things. How? Two ways. One, the first way, is he destroys uh, what we talked about in the Cain Abel, the comparison apparatus, the pecking order, the need to be better than someone else. And how does he do this? As he comes in, Jesus destroyed the wall that was between us. Now, I said earlier, that was a literal wall. In the temple, right, there was a court of the Gentiles outside, but, but going into the inner sanctum of the temple, it was the court of the women and then the elders, and then finally the Holy of Holies, that the Jewish people were closer to God. The Gentile people were on the other side of the wall, right? And there were signs up there that if they dared cross that, they would be killed. And this is what God abolishes. He destroys that wall. Of, of putting people out on the other side and thinking we're closer to God. Both of the people need the peace. The covenant people need the gospel of peace and the non-covenant people need the gospel of peace. And God destroyed that wall. It's the same thing at the resurrection when the curtain came down. We all, and you heard that in that scripture, have access to God. He de deals with that wall. Now, why do walls come up? So we're living in a time of social distancing, right? It's killing some of us to not be able to hug or handshakes. And, and we know why we have to do it. But let me tell you something that's way more devious. It's called relational distancing. That's why walls come up. Why do you think laws of apartheid ended up after slavery in America? Jim and Jane Crow laws. Uh, why do you think men and women were separated? Uh, women didn't even have the power to vote. Uh, why, why were there anti-miscegenation laws in America that made it illegal? for me to marry my wife when I was eight years old in neighboring Indiana. Why do these laws come up? Why do we live in gated communities? Why are churches so segregated? Because we need to know there's somebody we're better than. And that creates a relational distance. We're relationally distanced from one another. That's why it's so important that we have communities of people that aren't just like us. So we can tear down, the wall has already been torn down, but we can live into it and quit acting like there are, I'm closer to this and the other people are just out there on the other side of the wall. We need to hear this, that both the Jews and the Gentiles needed salvation. The Jews thought they had it, but you can't get saved and then live on the other side of the wall. That's impossible. And so God is dealing with relational distancing and we all have it don't honestly we have them the unconscious biases i was trained in that uh this past summer in a very extensive training all of us have un biases some we're conscious of many we're unconscious of you know what the two biggest biases are affinity bias and confirmation bias affinity bias is we want to be around people like us like the pharisee in the temple right uh confirmation bias is we want people to confirm what we believe so you wonder why you watch a news network you watch? It's not to get news. It's to have people confirm what you already believe. And anything that doesn't confirm that is fake, right? And, and God comes in to destroy those walls and to destroy those biases and, and to bring us together. Even the Bible scholar didn't know who his neighbor was. And Jesus told that parable, you know, the parable of the Good Samaritan. But we miss the fact that it was a good Samaritan. In a Bible-believing Jewish person, there was no such thing. And when Jesus said, who was the neighbor in that story? Who, who, who acted like, you know, the God-filled, spirit-filled, law-abiding neighbor? And the, and the Bible scholar knew the answer. It was the Samaritan. But he had so much hatred in his heart, he couldn't even say the word. He just said, the one who showed kindness. You see, God is creating a new humanity. Jesus was creating a new humanity. And we all need this. So he destroys this relational distancing. 
that's created because of the brokenness in the human heart. And then secondly, he comes in and reshuffles the layers of your identity deck. Now, what do I mean by that? That all of us have things we're proud of. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Our cultural heritage, uh, the things we've achieved. Like, I'm proud. Um, you know, I, I work real hard, and I want to one day play Division I basketball, and I was able to do that. I am proud of my Pennsylvania Dutch, you know, German heritage. I'm proud of that. I'm proud to be from Youngstown and the blue-collar ethos that's in that. But when the affirmation comes from the gospel that we have been affirmed, accepted and ultimately, ultimately loved by the Lord of the universe. That becomes the fundamental identity in our lives and all those other things become very, very uh, pale in comparison. That God reshuffles this so that priority is in him. That's why Paul, the former Pharisee, so proud of his education, so proud of the law, now preaches this gospel and when asked why, he says, it's me, but it's not me. It's Christ who lives in me, okay? And it loosens you up when you know that. It loosens you up to not be so tightly ingrained in my politics or my culture or my background. No, my identity as a child of God first. And then we can begin to dissipate the historic enmity, the active hatred that can emerge in any one of our hearts. So God is recreating the human race. That's what Paul says. God is recreating the human race as it ought to be. And where's he doing that? Inside the church. That's our marching orders, Garfield, to represent a reconciled people and bring that ministry of reconciliation to the world. So how does God bring it into effect? Let me wrap this up. He does it through the cross of Jesus Christ. You read, read this passage um, in, in 2 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, Ephesians 2, 15 through 16. It says, God has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create to himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, watch this, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, putting to death that hostility through it. In fact, the literal Greek says that God slew the hatred, the hostility, the enmity on the cross. It's kind of interesting. Wait a minute. The only person that died on the cross was Jesus. Where was hatred killed? Well, that's why I said 2 Corinthians a minute ago tells us that God made him who knew no sin to be sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. That because um, we have been hostile to one another, God should be hostile to us. If we're hostile to others who bear the image of God, we're being hostile to God. So God in turn should be hostile to us. If we have spent our time destroying one another, and we have, and history runs red in the blood of our acts, then God should destroy us. But God took that hatred, that inhumanity, and put it on Jesus. So, that God did, so the destruction that we deserve came down on him. Let me ask you this. Is Jesus Christ superior to you and me? I'd say so, right? I mean, he's God. He was no beginning, no end, ultimately holy. But if he who is superior, what does it say? Humbled himself, taking on the form of a servant. In fact, Hebrews 2 verse 11 says that even Jesus the Christ is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. Though we were inferior, he identified with us at the cost of his life. See, and when the cross of Jesus Christ is at the center of your life, you can't be ashamed of other brothers and sisters, that you know that you who were not perfect have been made perfect through his perfect love, and you will call others your brother and sister too. So are we a church like that, friends? Do we take this seriously? Now, no church can do it perfectly. No church can do it completely. But are you willing to stretch? Are we willing to stretch to be inclusive and go to the mat like that? To be a new humanity? Our willingness, listen to me say this, our willingness to sacrifice and work at this is one of the main evidences that God's power is at work in the world and that the gospel changes everything. 
That's why we will ourselves to walk, work, and worship together as one across all of the historic and current enmities so that we can make a statement that we don't do it perfectly, but because we try to do it, it's evidence to the world that God's power is still at work and God has not uh, given up on us. God is doing a building project. That's what the end of Ephesians says. Look how that passage closed. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you're citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Watch this. Built on the foundation of the apostles, the prophets, with Christ himself as a cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. God is building his new humanity in the church. I want to close this in a few minutes I have left. Pastor Terry shared with me a wonderful book by a, man, a woman named Diane Strickland. It's called Better Together. Diane spent some time in Rwanda. Now, if you remember Rwanda, 20 years ago, one of the places of the greatest historic enmity and tragedies that happened in the modern world. One million people were killed in Rwanda in 40 days. I remember the Jesuit priest, the priest that was there who said, there are no devils left in hell. They're all here in Rwanda. This historic enmity and hatred between the Hutus and the Tutsis. And after that horrible tragedy, there was a reconciliation endeavor created to rebuild the country, to make a new humanity in place of the two. And they had people who were willing to do it, people who had suffered incredible loss, people who had murdered others out of hatred. And many of them were now living with their own self-hatred for what they had done. And they put them in what they called transformation villages, that together they would no longer be a tribe they would just be one people. And Diane interviewed a woman named Grace. Boy, God always puts his fingerprints in these stories, doesn't he? A woman named Grace, a man named John. Grace lost her whole family in the horror of that genocide. John was one of the ones on the other side who killed her family members. And they were placed in this transformation village to live side by side. They gave them a plot of land and a pile of bricks. And they were called to use those bricks and build their dwelling place in this new village. And Grace said that, you know, she did not want to be anywhere near John. There was so much hatred in her heart. John did not want to be anywhere near Grace because it only exasperated his own self-hatred and loathing himself for what he has done. But so they stayed away from each other, decided to build separate dwellings. But Grace said they always had to meet at the brick pile <laughs> to get their bricks and go back and build their houses. And every day as they met at the brick pile, their hearts began to warm toward one another to the point that many years later, when Diane interviewed them, Grace said that now she and John are family. She pats his hand gently. John cries tears of repentance. Why? because they were being built into something better, into, into, into something new, a new humanity. But you know what they did? They did the work. They went to the brick pile. Garfield Church, are you willing to do that work? It's hard. It's gonna involve personal sacrifice. It's a lot easier to go with your affinity bias and your confirmation bias and you know, go with birds of, a, of the same feather and flock together. It's a lot easier to be in a church where everybody votes like you and looks like you and worships like you and believes all the same things you do. It's a little more difficult to be in the Revelation 7-9 church of every nation, uh, tribe, people, and language. But are you willing to go to the brick pile to make evidence that God is at work in this divided world. He was at work then. He broke the division down in the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the reality that we're trying to live out now. So let's go to the communion table today, okay? Let's go to the brick pile. Let's do some work together. And here's what I want you to do. When you go to that communion table today, would you go with you taking whoever it is, whatever group of people, maybe it's an individual person, that just riles you up, that just makes you see red, you're sure they're everything that's wrong with the world, would you take them with you today 
And will you go to Christ's table together and see if he not, might not begin to make one people out of the two? That's my prayer. Let's go to the table together. On the cross, Jesus made one new humanity, but before he went to the cross, he shared a meal with his followers and he shares it today with us. And at that last meal where he was gathered with his disciples, he took the bread that they were to share and he thanked his father for it. And imagine that, being thankful when you know that you're going um, to the cross, going to great suffering. Um, on our behalf and he took the bread and he thanked his father for it and he broke it and he said this is my body broken for you and Christ's body is broken into pieces so that we might become one and so as you receive this today whatever you have at hand take it and receive it this is the body of Christ broken for you And during this meal, Jesus took the cup, the cup that they would share, and he again thanked his Father. And he blessed it, and he said, This is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take this bread and this cup in remembrance of me. And the meaning of remember is remembering, is putting the members of the body back together. And so as you drink of the cup, allow it to not only bring you wholeness and healing, but remind you that we are one new humanity. And so fortified by this holy meal, let it strengthen you for the hard work of reconciliation that we share, that God has called us to as the church, the capital C church, and Garfield Memorial is a, is a witness to that and is as we widen the circle, as we help people come to know Christ, broken as we are. Let's go out and do the hard work. The world needs us, and we have, we've been equipped by the hearing of the word, by the praising of God, by praying, and by receiving the body and the very blood of Jesus Christ. Go in that power, in Jesus' name.